If you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know that we are in 2 Corinthians 5, where we, where we hear these phenomenal words, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We've been talking for the last couple of weeks how, how this incredible statement is a present tense thing. The old is already gone. The new is already here. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to do anything for it to leave or do anything for it to come. It is a present tense reality for us. It is here. The old is gone. It's dead. The new is here and we live in that. But as Paul lays out 2 Corinthians 5, as he starts to walk us through what does it mean, there is some huge tension points between what does it mean to be in the old creation, what does it mean to be in the new creation. And these tension points of moving from one to the other are so important. It's because it's in these tension points of wondering how do we move from here to there, This idea of I am stuck where I am right now, my old creation. I want to be over here in the new, but I keep living my old. That tension point is the point of transformation in our lives. And the Apostle Paul begins to walk us through what does it mean to to live in this new creation. Even though the old is gone, we still have a choice of whether we're going to live in it or not. And moving from one to the other causes some huge tension in our lives. And I think that's why Scripture tells us over and over again to persevere in trials. James 1, consider it joy when you face these trials and these testings and this this tension of moving from one to the other. Consider it joy because it is through those trials, it is through this testing of our faith that we develop maturity in life. That's James' words. Paul's words are, it is through these trials and testings that we move from the old creation that has already gone to the new creation that is here. If you would turn with me in your copy of God's Word to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 says this, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. This is what Pastor Brad's been talking about for the last two weeks. And that that new body that we receive, that new spirit that has already been given to us, and we live in those. And then verse 7 comes and it says, For we live by faith. And not sight. Because we have moved from the old creation, because we now live in the new creation, Paul says, we now live by faith and not by sight. Now, God created us to be, well, people of senses, right? We use our sight. We use our ears. That's how we experience life. God understands that. But what he's telling us here is that when we become that new creation, when we live in that new creation, our confidence, our Our trust, our kind of bedrock understanding the world is not about what I experience here and now. It's about what God says is true and right. It's living by faith in Him. That's what that statement means. Living by faith is understanding that God's ways are right even when they contradict our own experience. It's hard to do. Living by faith means accepting and walking in God's promises even if they haven't come to fruition, even if we don't understand today. And there's that tension point, right? We live in that right now in this COVID kind of world where we understood what the old normal was like. We're in transition right now and that transition is the transformation process that brings us to the new normal, which is our new creation. There's so many promises in God's Word. And that one in Romans 8 just comes to my mind almost daily in these, this time of quarantine. All things work together for those who love the Lord. I don't experience that on a day-to-day basis. I don't experience that on an hour-to-hour basis. So when I live by sight, I get worried. I get filled with anxiety because things aren't going well. But when we... Live by faith. We say, God, your promises are good. And even in this thing in which we live right now, you are transforming our lives. He goes on to say in verse, in verse 9 this incredible statement, so we make it our goal to please him. 
We talked about some new things that come with this new creation, the new body, a new spirit. This morning we want to focus in on what does this mean that we have a new goal, a new aim, a new ambition in life. The old goal was pleasing self. The old goal is a self-focused goal. The new goal is to please our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there's this tension from moving one to the other. In fact, most of us live kind of in a feet both worlds kind of in mentality that we are stuck pleasing ourselves. We know we're supposed to please Christ, but we're stuck pleasing ourselves. And what God's Word is trying to get us to do is to acknowledge those places in which we are not living the new creation. Getting us to acknowledge those places where, well, we're, we're pleasing self and, and not Jesus. If our goal is to please Him, where are we living where we don't please Him? In that area, in that transition, is that tension point, and it is that place of transformation. If we don't acknowledge those tension points, if we don't acknowledge that we're stuck over here in whatever areas of our life, if we don't acknowledge that we really haven't moved far past this old creation, then we're never going to be transformed by the power of God. We're never going to make our way over to, well, this new goal, this new purpose, this this new aim and ambition of pleasing our Lord and Savior. So for the past few weeks, what we've done is given some time for you at home to talk about some of these things in God's Word. Giving you some questions to think about, maybe discuss in your groups at home with your family, if you're with other people there watching. Maybe it's online. Maybe it's just by yourself and you're ruminating about this, thinking about what it means before the Lord. And so we're going to give you some different questions here this morning. But before we do that, I've actually asked Pastor Brad and Pastor Jack to come on up here. And I've got a question for both of them that kind of speaks directly to the question that you are going to be uh, going to be kind of facing at home and my question for you too so maybe brad you can uh, you can start us off here today the question is is when do you most experience that tension moving from the old self you know self-centeredness to the new self living in christ so just share this a little bit <laughs> so for me i always struggled with uh the limitation, the frailty of, huma- of being human, this idea of being weak or powerless and uh, needing the power of God in my life. I'd much rather do it in my own strength, in my own power. And uh, But the reality is, is that in Christ, he's given me a power and a strength that um, exceeds and goes beyond my human limitations. And so the tension's always been for me to, to still want to do it my way and my strength and my power um, and not recognize my weakness before him. Um, that's always plagued me. Yeah. Jack, what you? I guess I'd rather not answer this question publicly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think of that tension. I think of, um, I think of right now what's going on in our world. Uh, and, and for me, that means uh, where where my struggles are most magnified are in my own home. And so the tension is living for myself and even in how I selfishly carry myself as a husband and a father so often. And uh, part of it is because I, I want to get out and do stuff, and and then sometimes they bear the brunt of that in the relationships. And it's just pride, pride getting in the way um, versus who I need to be in Christ. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. I'm going to bring you up in just a little bit again. So... Again, not easy to answer some of these questions, but at home I've got a kind of a similar question. It's not the same exact thing. It's a, maybe simplified and focus a little bit more on this idea of, of not living for self. That's the, that's the old goal. That's the old ambition that it's all about us. Whatever we do in life is pleasing us. Whatever we do is so that we will be blessed, so that we will have good things. So the question we want you to just take a couple minutes and answer this morning is this. In which way do you continue... To live for self. We all do that, right? We all live for self. But in what way do you do that? Maybe even a more simple question to answer. How were you selfish this week? And just kind of talk about that a little bit. We're going to give you a couple minutes here on screen. We'll have a little countdown like we've done in the past. Just to to talk about this in your families here this morning. Go ahead.
So it truly is in those tension points that God has the opportunity to move you from living in the old creation to living the new creation. And if you struggle to answering that, I would encourage you to maybe spend some time this week before the Lord. Maybe it's journaling, maybe it's praying, maybe it's talking with someone. And ask God to, to show you where you are not living like you should. Because if you're unaware of those areas, if you, if you have no tension between living the old life and living the new life, then you're not allowing God to truly transform you to be like He wants you to be. Well, verse 9 goes to say that we make it our goal to please him that is that is our new ambition our new aim in life but but how do we do this how do we physically move from the old goal of pleasing self to the to the new goal of pleasing god how do we do that in our life well i i went to to school uh, for music i studied french horn and piano amongst other things and i remember my very first french horn lesson with uh, dr richard chenoweth I thought I was a good player. I thought I was a good musician. I went in pretty confident to that first lesson, and I was laid low. For the first couple months, I was just gulping air because I couldn't learn fast enough the things that he wanted me to learn. But after four years of spending time with Dr. Chenoweth, who was my teacher, became a mentor, became a true friend, my playing changed. I started sounding like him. I had a long ways to go to becoming like him, but after four years, I started to like the same music he liked. I started listening to the same thing he listened to. Why? Because I desired to please him. He had what I wanted. He had a style of playing that I sought after. So for four years, I imitated my teacher, Dr. Richard Chenoweth. You probably do that the same thing in your world, whether it's a soccer coach, a baseball coach, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a teacher. Those people that we want to please, those people that we want to become like, we imitate them. Now, the word imitation in our culture today is not a very highly valued term. We don't like the word imitation. Jesus actually doesn't really like the hypocrisy that comes from imitation either. In Matthew 23, he says seven times, Woe to you hypocrites. But our world's vision and and version of not being a hypocrite is simply to be yourself. Right? Be yourself, Aladdin tells Genie. That's what the world says we are to do. And yet here is the problem. When we are authentically ourselves, we are living in our old nature. In fact, I was reading a while back a a book called I Told Me So by Greg Elsoff. And he says this, Jesus doesn't call us to be authentic. He calls us to be imitators of him. This is huge. That we would imitate Jesus. This isn't some just little thing we add to our life. This isn't taking a look at our daily schedule and saying, hmm, where can I fit in a little bit of prayer? Maybe I can do it on the commute to work. I'm not doing anything. I could just turn off the radio and pray. Not a bad idea, but you haven't transformed your living like Jesus. It's not looking at your to-do list and saying, you know, I could probably squeeze a little Bible reading between 5 and 5.10 before the meal. That's not how we imitate Jesus. We imitate Jesus by being all in to what he has done. That means changing up our schedule and changing up our life. Pastor Brad's been sharing for the last few weeks of what does that look like to spend time in rest and meditation and being before God as your first and primary relationship. Imitating God is a, is a fundamental shift in absolutely everything you do. And it is that pathway from, from living that old life to living that new life. Because as we begin to imitate Jesus, as we begin to do the things that He did, as we begin to turn, turn our other cheek to, the, to those slanders and those laughs, as we begin to sacrifice ourselves to give to others, as we, as we begin to give of ourselves in action ways to others like Jesus did, that's when... Our new self starts to take hold. That's when it becomes less imitating Christ and becoming like Christ likeness. That is the pathway of moving from this old this old goal of pleasing self to, to pleasing Jesus. We we do what he did. 
that's a whole challenge in God's Word is to help us to understand what did Jesus do and how do we do it. So the question we have for you here this morning is, where are you imitating Jesus? Or maybe more importantly in this understanding of tension, where are you not imitating him? So I'm going to invite the, the pastors to come on up once again here this morning. In a couple of seconds, we're going to ask the same exact question this time of you that we're going to ask of these guys. But uh, maybe, Jack, you can start us off this time. The, the question we have for you here um, this morning, if I can find it, is what does imitating Jesus look like to you? I think the, uh, the toughest concept of the old is gone and the new has come is, is the feeling like I have to figure it all out immediately. Mm when I come to faith in Christ. And so for me, imitating Christ means becoming more like him today than I was yesterday. And it's something I challenge our students on, that, that this walk with Christ is a process, that the new has come, that's the new spirit within me, but now my actions need to slowly begin to replicate that which I've said. So for me, the imitation is that process of each day becoming more like Christ. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Jesus always was present with his heavenly father, and, and yet when he was here on earth, he kind of modeled for us, you know, what it looked like to take a moment and go and spend time with the Lord, time with his father, uh, in the middle of the day, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, at any point in the time, he practiced Sabbath, he t- took times of silence and solitude, and so for me, it's been, uh, you know, with my desire to do everything and impress people with my ability to do uh, is I have to practice doing things present with him. That the real power available to us is to be present with him uh, in every moment. And I have to practice that. Like uh, you were talking about earlier, Aaron, like this idea of like, I got to keep learning how to do this and practice it until it becomes more of a natural part of me to be present with God. Thanks, guys. All right, so uh, your turn at home. Same question that uh, Brad and Jack just uh, answered. What does imitating Jesus look like to you? And maybe a follow-up question or a very kind of practical question you can ask yourself is, is in what way do you want to imitate Jesus this week? Very practically speaking, what do you need to do from from moving from this old goal of pleasing self to to pleasing Jesus by imitating what he has done? What is something that you need to do this week? So take a couple minutes at home, same thing, discuss this with yourselves, take some time to kind of lean into what does this mean for you here today? Go ahead.
A few uh, weeks ago, I uh, started reading a book by Francis Chan called Letter to the Church. If you want uh, a challenge to what does it mean to live in and experience a life in in church, I challenge you to read that book. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, it's been really uh, inspiring to me and uh, challenging to me. In uh, one of the opening chapters, he he talks about an illustration that really uh, kind of brought home to me what we've been talking about in this idea of moving from the old to the new and this idea of, of imitating Christ in this trans, transformational transition process. And, and he uses the illustrations of a pair of skates. These don't quite fit me. They're kind of small. But uh, he uses the illustration that says uh, that what if salvation were, were like a pair of skates that you got for a gift? Right? Your grandma gives you something when you're a little kid. You open it up and it's a pair of skates. And you're like, what am I supposed to do with these things? So you strap them on and you go out on the ice and you begin to learn how to skate. You do the twirls and you do the flips and you start doing like this girl does the, the triple sow cow or the triple toe flip or whatever the terminology for figure skating could be. You are excelling at your salvation. You are excelling in what it means to be a skater to you and you are loving it. It's bringing you incredible, immense joy. And the more you learn about it, the more you are invested in what does it mean to, well, to be able to skate. But in this process of life and reading the instructions manual for ice skating, I'm not sure there is such a thing, you realize that, you know what, there may be a different purpose for these things. Instead of me kind of swirling around in the ice and doing the triple sow cow or whatever the thing is called, there is another purpose, and that purpose is that you maybe would be on a, a championship hockey team. Now, I know the skates would look different, but what if you were given that knowledge that, you know, my salvation is a little different than what I thought it was? And maybe you've never understood that that maybe a hockey player and the life of Christ could be synonymous. Goal, you got to love that, right? But I love this illustration because it is so true to our life today. For most of us, we look at our gift of salvation in our old self of, man, this is great. Look how God has blessed me and I'm going to excel in this. And Francis Chan makes a statement that most of us never move beyond the twirls and the spins to experience life on mission with Jesus. We never experience that, that team understanding that Jesus gives us of sacrificing for others, of giving our lives for others, of working with others in unity, of allowing our strengths and weaknesses to be bonded with other strengths and weaknesses. This is true life. This is what it means to move from, well, a self-centered understanding of our salvation to a true Christ-centered, pleasing Him, doing what He did, being on mission with our Savior. I want to challenge you this week that Paul gives us this encouragement Paul wants us to move from this old goal of pleasing self, even in our understanding of salvation and spirituality, to move by imitating Jesus, doing what he did, and experience a new goal, a new aim, a new ambition to please him by serving others, by giving our lives as he did. That's... Really the crux of 2 Corinthians 5. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation with a new goal to please Him. A couple weeks ago, I asked uh, some of our musicians to help help us out for this morning's service. I've asked Weston to put together some, some music for a song that you probably know well. I asked Ethan Lang if he would be willing to sing this song and record it so we can show it today. It's a song that speaks to the fact that God takes us from where we are and moves us to a place of beautiful. He takes, as the song says, ugly things and makes them beautiful. He takes things that are ragged and set on, on self-serving to something that is beautiful, pleasing Him. I want you to listen to these words, sing along maybe this morning, but let the Spirit of God, through the Scripture of His Word, pack your heart today that you would have a new goal of pleasing Him by imitating Him. 
such great words. Thanks, Wes and Ethan, for putting that together for us. It's that constant reminder again that God is in that process of transforming us from the old to new. And it is our responsibility to step into that process, allow that to happen by facing those tension points in our life. I want to thank you for joining with us online here today. Thank you to you moms. We, we are so excited to have you join with us here. And it's a great joy to be able to celebrate this day with you. Pray that you guys would have a great week. Hope to see you back next Sunday on live. And uh, have a great week. Thanks.